Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Decryption and I hope you are well. In today's tutorial, I'm going to show you how to set this cool hot dog stand up, just like Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, where you can pick your food and I can come in and say I want a hot I dog. He speaks to us, the health goes up and the m money goes down. Finger lick. Oh yeah, copyright. Enjoy. And then we Goodbye. can spend all our money on hot dogs. So let's get started. So the first thing you need is you will need a shop of some kind. You can either have a new level or anything like that. So for me, I'm going to do a hot cart because we're, it's, a, it's a racetrack and we're just going to give him some funky things. So here's one I made earlier. So I have this hot dog here and um, he's just my typical NPC. He doesn't really do anything special and I've just got a static mesh of a hot cart. So I've tried to break this video down into segments that makes the most sense hopefully so we can easily find our way and we're not jumping everywhere. So where we're going to start first is we need to give the player some sort of health so we can actually increase it when you eat food. If you've already got a health system you can skip to the time on screen now to jump to the cash system. So for the health system I've tried to make it as flexible as possible without being game specific. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up into my blueprints folder and I'm going to create a new folder called component. Inside here I'm going to create a new blueprint class and a type of actor component and I'm going to call it BAC for blueprint actor component underscore damageable and this is a component that you can place on any actor and if they're damageable as in they can take damage they would theoretically have a health whether that health is one for instant death or a hundred for a big bot. So I'm just going to delete the two events out and I'm going to add two variables in here one a current health and that'll be a type of integer then I'm going to duplicate this with control D and I'm going to call it max health just going to compile and give these some default values so for the max health I'm just going to set to 100 and for the current health because I want to start with less health I'm going to set to 50 so we can see it actually takes effect in game. I'm going to tick the two eyeballs so we can see it public. Next, when we receive a health update or we change our max health, we want to be able to tell everything that needs it we have changed our health. So I'm going to create an event dispatcher here called on health chain. If you don't know what an event dispatcher is, think of it just like a variable but you can store code in it instead. So simply by dragging it out and doing a sign, you can see we can now add code to this event dispatcher just like we could data and a variable. So we could add loads of different calls to this on health change from the HUD, from objectives, and anytime this on health change is called, it will run all the code underneath it. And then all I'm going to do is tap on my event dispatcher and I'm going to give two inputs. The first one will be new health and it'll be a type of integer. And then the next one will be new max health, also type of integer. So anytime we call on health change, we will tell it what the new health and new max health is so everything can already know. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a function in here called update health. And this is going to be what we call anywhere that needs it whenever we need to update the health. From the update health I'm going to add an input of value and this is going to be the value that we need to affect the health by whether it's positive or negative. So I'm going to drag in the current health and I'm just going to do a set and connect it up and then I'm also going to drag in the current health and then just plus these together from the current health. So if value is positive it will increase the current health and then we set it. If value is negative then it will decrease the current health and then we set it. Just before we set it I'm just going to drag off from here and I'm going to do a clamp on the integer and I'm just going to set the max to our max health. All a clamp does is limit what something can be. So if our maximum is 100 and we try to set the value to 110, clamp will reduce it to 100 and then plug it into the set. So we now can't go over the health. If you want to be able to go over your maximum health, then don't add a clamp. And then the final thing we need to do is just call on health change like so. And then we can pass in our new health and then our new max health. We can compile and save. Next, if you open up your player, so in my case it's the first person character, but if you've got a third person or a custom one, and then all I'm going to do is add in my damageable component like so and I can hit compile and save. Now we've done the health component or you've skipped that step because you've already got one we need to do some sort of cache system and again I'm going to do this as a component because different things might be able to store cash. It'd be a good way to have a generic place where we can update somebody's cash, remove the cash and it can work on spending machines, registers or people. So the exact same process and if you do have a cache system already feel free to skip this step. But I'm going to create a blueprint class of type act component, EAC cash and I'm going to open this up. I'm going to delete the two events in there and I'm going to create a new variable of cash and I'm just going to set it tag in. You can call this whatever you want, make sure you tick the eyeball, but I'm going to call mine cash. You can call it gold, money, anything. Then I'm going to add an event dispatcher of on cash change and I'm going to add an input of new cash value and just set it to an int. And then I'm going to create a new function called cash change and this will take in a value type of integer and then all we're going to do is we're going to get the cash and I'm going to plus onto it. So if the value is 
is positive, it will increase the cash. If the value is negative, it will decrease it. And then I don't need to limit how much cash you can have. Theoretically, you could add a clamp node here and just say the maximum amount of cash you're allowed to carry is 99999. But it doesn't really matter. And then all you do from here is just set cash. So finally, just call your event on cash change. And I'm just going to call it and I'm going to plug in the new cash value like so. Finally, jump to your character and then just cash component. I'm just going to name mine cash. Now on the player, if you click the cash, you can set its default value. So I'm going to say he has 20 fictional coins. And then the damageable, which I did earlier, you can see he's already got current health. Compile and save. Now that we've had the components to manage the player's health and their cash, I need to update my main HUD in order to display this on screen so we know it's when it's actually working. Again, if you've got a HUD already with this on, feel free to skip this step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my existing HUD. If you don't have an existing HUD, just come to your content drawer in your UI folder, right click user interface widget print and just call it HUD. Then on your player, add it into the viewport. So I've already got an existing one here. It's really basic. I've got a tutorial at the top and an interact here at the bottom. So what I'm going to do underneath the canvas panel is I'm going to add a progress bar and you can add your health however you want. And I'm just going to call the PB health. I'm going to anchor it You holding control and shift to the top left corner. Then I'm going to increase its size to something like 300 and reduce its height. So it's just a small little bar. I'm going to give it a position X of minus 50 and a position Y of 50. Just move it down from the top. I'll do 25. There we go. And then I'm just going to set the percent to something like 0.4 just so we can see the color. It's currently blue. But I don't want it blue. I know San Andreas uses red, but I'm going to go with a green, but I'm just going to make it a little bit lighter of a green. So. And there is my health. Make sure it's as a variable. And that's all we need to do for that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a rich text and I'm going to add this just like I did before holding control and shift to the top left corner. I'm just going to give it a value of, I don't know, $50 and I'm going to click the set style and I'm going to set it to my existing one. If you don't have a set style yet, it's a good thing to have. All you need to do is come into your content drawer, right click miscellaneous data table and select rich text style row. Once you've done that, you can open it up and just add some basic styles. Default will be the one that's applied to everything. So you can see I have default, imp for important and import to render my import. Link in the description for my other tutorials where I set this up. So I'm now just going to hit compile just to see it render. Then you can see it's there nice and well. But I don't like that it's Y. So I'm just going to wrap it in my imp tag because it's important. And you can see it's now better colored. I'm going to set the position to be the same. So minus 25. Uh, I'll set the width to be 300. So it's the same as the bar. And I'll set it to something like 50. So it's just below the health bar. So now I'm going to rename that to RTB hash. And I'm going to make sure it's a variable. Compile and save. I'm going to jump into my graph on the HUD. And I'm just going to add my event construct. Which basically runs as soon as this HUD is loaded. And then I'm going to right click. And I'm going to do get player horn. From here I'm going to cast it to my first person character. Then from here I can drag off. And I can get their damageable component. And I can assign an event on health change by so. So when the health changes. We now need to update the progress bar. So I'm going to come and create a new function called a health. Just to keep it tidy. And it's going to take two inputs. The first new health type of int. And the second one will be new, new max health, like so. I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a map range clamp. And what this does is allow you to give it a value, such as our new health, and say what its current range is. So the range B will be our max health, like so. And then the output range is we want it between 0 and 1, because the progress bar is between 0 and 1. And this will do all the math logic you need in order to calculate it from 0 to 100 or 0 to a million to between 0 and 1 for you. And then from here, we can just drag in our progress bar and I can just do set percent and then I can connect in the new percent and then connect in to the exit. Finally, jump back to the event graph and after this I can just plug in the update health. And the final thing to do on this on this health change is I'm just going to copy the update health and I'm going to paste it after the bind and then I'm just going to connect in players current health and their mass health. This will just mean as soon as you load the game the HUD will ult itself. You'll see now if I try the bar has jumped up to half full because that's where it needs to be. Perfect. Next, let's work on our cash amount. So I'm going to drag from the player again. Uh, I'll just do it up top and I'll do cash and it'll give me the cash component. And then just like we've done before, I'm going to drag from this and I'm going to assign an event on cash change. I'm going to connect it up to the update health just so it continues. Then we need a function in order to update the cash. So I'm going to add a new function called update cash. And this one's going to be just as simple where we have an input of new cash value. Then I'm going to drag in my rich text cash and I'm going to set the text. Then what I am going to do is I'm going to drag 
So what I want it to do is if you're in negative cash, I want it to be red. If you're in positive cash, then it can be in you know, orange. So what I'm going to do is open up my DT style that I discussed a moment ago, and I'm actually going to come and duplicate the important. My imp is currently orange, so I'm going to set this to bad. And I'm going to open up the text style and just grab the color, and I'm just going to roughly put it in the same position, but in the red, like so. There we go. So what this means we can do now is if we wrap something, bad it will be red and if we wrap in imp then it will be good so i'm going to get the new cash value and i'm just going to say is less than if it is then i'm going to drag off and do select and make sure you click the one that looks like a fold if it's true then it means it's less than zero so i'm going to make a literal string so and i'm just going to type the word bad just like and i'm going to copy it above it and i'm going to connect it to the false if it's false then it means it's good so i'm just going to set it or you can call it whatever you want then in the format text here i'm going to wrap curly brace and i'm going to style then i'm going to put my dollar because i want it to be dollars you call whatever you want and I'm going to put curly brace again and put cash and close the curly brace and finally I'm just going to wrap it in a closing brace one last thing is to wrap the style curly brace with angle brackets like so 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 it will come in and when we connect style to the return value and cash to the cash it will replace the style with good or bad depending what value we're in and then the cash amount finally come back to the event graph and just cash function so cash value at the top on the game begins and I'll just drag from the get connect wrap it in a comment and now you'll see once we start it is we've got $50 but I know we've got 20 so the screen should update to show $20 perfect and that ladies and gentlemen is the basic HUD setup we need for this game so now this is where the real tutorial begins so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a place where we can store our food at each vendor or whether you've just got one or you've got 50 different ones all the different food items will exist so I'm going to come back to my blueprints and I'm going to go into the data folder and I'm going to create a new folder in here called food inside here I'm going to create a new blueprint class and it'll be a type of primary data asset and i'm going to call this pda food i'm going to open so a primary data asset is a type where each asset data asset can store one item of detail and that's what it's meant for it might be a data asset your motorbike your all the different versions with the speeds and the properties can be different data assets it's not good for all of the occasions but sometimes it does come really high. and i'm going to set it to a type of tech the food. I'm going to tick the eyeball. I'll add another variable of HP value and I'm going to set this to an integer. This is going to be how much H. And finally, I'm going to add a cost. Any other variables here, such as fat increase or sub. This is the place to do it. I'm going to compile and save and just close it down because we don't need it now. Then, back in the content drawer where we've got click and I'm going to go miscellaneous data asset and it'll ask you what class do you want to use. So I'm just going to type my PDA and and I'm gonna DA underscore. So I'm gonna call mine hot dog and I'm gonna open it. So you can see we can add all the properties we need. So I'm gonna say it's a hot dog is the name. Uh, the HP value will be five. It's not very nutritious out of a hundred. And the cost be, I don't know how much these things cost, five. Five dollars for a hot dog. Does that sound too much? That'll be fine. And then just go ahead and you can either duplicate it or just keep creating all the different food that you need. And as you can see, here's some I made earlier. Well, I've got all sorts of different foods here, and if you open them up, they've all got values and costs. You can also add icons and anything else you want in here, eating sounds that I'm gonna stick to the basic. And now that you've got all your food, you can also categorize these however you want. They can go anywhere you want as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna create a new subfolder in here. I'm just gonna call it food products. I'm gonna add all these food products inside. I'm gonna keep the base class out of it and then I'm going to come in and now we can create our actual storage for the each store so now we can create the actual storage for the store so what's the store's name does it have a logo and then what food does it serve so I'm going to right click inside this food subfolder I'm going to create a new blueprint structure and I'm going to call it s underscore food store and the first variable I'm going to set it to store name and this will just be a type test like so and I'm going to add a new another variable and this will be food and this time I can set this to the type of my PDA food asset and I'm just going to right click it and I'm just going to set it to be a type of array like so and then the only other things I'm going to add here is I'm going to add start audio which will be when you walk up and it'll say hello how can I serve you today or something like that I'm going to set it to a single type and I'm going to search for a sound cue but I'm not going to use an object reference like it will default add I'm going to add a soft object reference 
and this means it won't load it the, all the audio in memory until we actively tell it to, saving some memory. And then I'm going to add another one just below this called purchase audio, and this is going to be when you click something and it goes, hope you enjoy. And then I'm going to add an exit audio, which will be goodbye, and they'll all be sound object references like so. Now that we have our struct set up, we can now create a data table that will manage the store. I'm going to create a new folder called stores, and inside here I'm going to right click miscellaneous data table, and I'm going to pick my new S food store, and I'm going to call it DT food stores. I'm going to open this up. So in here is where you add all the different rows for every store you want. So I'm going to add a new one here. I'm going to set the row name to be the name of my store, the Glenn's hot dog stand, and I'm going to, in the store name, this is where I can format it nice, nicer like so. The food, this is where I can start dragging in my data assets. So I'm going to come back to the food products and I'm going to sell. He's definitely going to sell a hot dog and you can add as many or as little as you want. Uh, he also is doing skewers because you can probably make that and for some reason he's doing exotic mango smoothies. Now for the start audio, you can basically add any audio you want. It doesn't even have to be vocal. So what I've done is I've gone into my sounds folder and in my voices, shots and into Glenn's hot dog stand and then inside Glenn's hot dog stand, you will see I have my start, my purchase and my exit audio. All I have done is used is got some audio lines that would work for each aspect so for my start oh um yes I've got him just shocked somebody's come up and what I've done is created a sound cue from all of them. so if you just right click on your first audio hold shift and click on all the others you want right click and choose create sound cue it will automatically set your sound cue up with a random note in the all in so every time you play it uh... Hi, what do you want? Oh, you can see the red can lines I, are jumping oh, between them can I, completely oh, random. Oh, um, yes? And that's how we can achieve it, just using a single sound cue. So all I did was I came into Eleven Labs, I typed something I'd want him to say, and then I just clicked generate. And after downloading it, converting it to a WAV file in Audacity or Audacium, whatever you want, then I imported it into Unreal. Just make sure you trim off the start and the end. They had their mine came with like a second silence for some reason. It just threw the illusion a little bit. So all I'm going to do now is drag in my start audio, purchase audio, and my exit audio. And you'll notice it will bind just like normal even though we set it to an object reference, it just means we have to load it ever so slightly differently. So now that we have our stores set up and you can add as many of these as you want, we next need to create a new input source and you begin the map. You don't want the ability to move anymore. You don't want to be able to interact, change your inventory, any of that. We want all that to be disabled. So you could go through and manually wrap all of those events in if is busy, if in the shop or something. But that's going to take a bunch of code changing. So looking at the new enhanced input system, I think I've found a better way to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into my blueprints input here. And if you're using the enhanced input system, you can follow this session. If you're using the old input system from UE4, I'm not sure what you could do there but you might just have to wrap everything in the if state so i'm going to duplicate this input map context here and i'm just going to call it imc for input mapping context player shot and i'm going to open it so you can see it's got all my existing interacts here but i'm just going to delete them all off for being in a shot. So when the menu's open, there's really only three you need. I'm going to duplicate the shoot. I'm just going to call it IA shot underscore purchase. So when you press enter or confirm, you have the and this is where you press up and down on the D-pad or the keypad change your select options. So I'm going to open this move up and I'm just going to change it from a value type of to axis 1d float the difference is the boolean the digital version will say press whereas this one axis float will tell us it's pressed but what value if it's zero it's not pressed if it's minus one or one it's up or down perfect and now that we've added these we can go to our mapping here and i can add all the different mappings so if i type shop underscore and i'll do purchase we can say to purchase it i want to press shift and on the controller i will say you press the bottom facing button so it's or a the mouse will just work around this next i'm going to add another one for my shop exit and I will say on the PC this is and then for the controller I will say it's the top button which will be triangle or whatever Xbox it is and then finally the last one will be the move so I'll add the shop move and I'll say for this I want the, the up arrow key or I'll press the down arrow key or because we're good to add our get users I'm going to add a W and an S in as well and then I'm going to add two more one for the d-pad up and then the final one for the d-pad down there we go so what this means is later we can switch between these two mapping contexts and then when we do it will outright disable 
enable all controls on the player because they're not physically set up to be able to use it. And now with that, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we've got to the stage where we can start working on the actual food menu system. We've done all the prerequisite we need in order to set it up. So we've got a HUD with our cash and our health. We've got our food and we've got our stores and we've got our input. So let's begin. So the way I'm going to action mine is I'm going to place a trigger in front of wherever the store is. Theoretically, you could place it in the middle of nowhere and it would still action. I'm going to open up my content drawer and I'm going to go to my blueprints. And I'm going to create a new blueprint here of type of actor and I'm going to call it BP Food Store. And I'm going to open it up. I'm going to add a box collision, which will be my trigger. So I'm going to name it trigger. And this will be how we start the actual food store. I'm going to just move it up so it's on the ground come in and drag it in front of the store like so place it where you want it to action you could add a fancy effect a fancy round thing anything you want for now I'm just going to untick hidden in game on the trigger so when we're actually in the game there so now I'm going to on overlap begin I'm going to delete all the other things above and I'm just going to straight from the other act I'm going to cast to my throughout this menu to actually activate things. So I'm going to drag off and I'm going to instantly promote this to a variable like so. I'm just going to call this player character and I'm going to do the same for the player controller. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to do get player controller and I'm going to promote this to a variable because we'll use this for adjusting the camera and other aspects over and over and over. So I'm going to write that in a comment of cash player just so we'll do it later. Player. called disable player so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to drag i'm going to drag off and do set and i'm going to set it to none immediate so if your character is running and they run past it so this will freeze them where they are and set the movement mode to none so they can't continue moving disable I'm going to set show mouse cursor and I'm going to tick it because we want the mouse cursor to be active otherwise we're not going to be able to click on things. If you're doing a controller only based game then you don't need to show the cursor. We just need to disable the player's input. So I'm going to drag from the player controller in and I'm going to get enhanced mouthful right there. Mapping content and this is where we remove the player's content. Add in contact. Add in the like so. So. Player, like so. Duplicate it and call it enable player. Everything back to enable. So instead of disable movement, can enable movement. The movement mode will be walking connect it back now in my game untick that but if you want the cursor visible because you're doing a top-down game or something keep it then for this time from the remove mapping context I'm going to drag the store in and from the adding I'm going to put the player default back in to enable the player which will save us some time later we need to actually go and get the details of the store so we know what to set I'm gonna do a get data row like so. For the data table I'm just going to plug in our stores. I'm going to promote it like so. Row name and I'm going to make sure I in the details view. So if the row is not found I'm just going to print out a string error found. Great and you can see we've got access to all the different variables so the first thing I want to do is I want to play the store audio to say kind of thing on these components I'm going to add an audio here and I'm going to come down into my event graph here and I'm just going to add a new custom event called play audio AC the input name will be audio and the reference input and this will be a type of the first way will be 
play the audio unless something else is playing. However, when you purchase it, I don't want him to say something every single time. I want it to be a bit random. So I'm going to pass the weighting of something like 0.6 or 0.8. So it won't always play the audio. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drag down my audio component here. And I'm going to check if audio is playing because if it's playing, we don't want to stop it and then play something else because that always sounds weird. From here, I'm going to drag off and do not boolean. So if it's not playing, I'm going to connect this to an and here. And then from the and, we want to right click and do get random ball with a weight and connect the weight into it. So if it's one, every single time. True, 50% of the time. And I'm going to connect that. And then only if these two criteria are met, Then we can begin loading the audio. So I'm going to drag off from the sound here and I'm going to type load and you'll see you have two options. Load asset block. We don't want to do that even though it's going to be quite quick because otherwise you're going to be freezing your code and running into hitches. So instead I'm going to choose the async load asset and I'm going to connect it to true. It will allow you to continue and run other code. we can then play the audio. So from the object, I'm going to cast this to my sound cue, like so. And I know this is going to be a sound cue, and I'm going to connect that to the completed. Make sure it's connected to the completed, otherwise you're going to get errors. You don't want it on the top one. If it's finally generated it, I can drag my audio component in, and I can do set sound, and I can connect in my sound cue. And then from the same audio, play and I can wrap all this in a nice little comment play audio async with a weight and now that we've done that we've got a really easy way after this row found back in your override and I'm going to call play audio async and then all we need to do is pass it a weight so I always want him to say something when he's when you first go to him the start audio will just like so. So you now see if we compile and save and come back to the trigger here, store's row name is Glenn's hot dog stand, that's correct. So I can begin by and you'll see if I run up to it. Uh hi what do you want? It'll speak to us. We can't do anything because we've not proceeded with the UI yet. So one thing you'll notice is if I see the trigger here that I look backwards and walk into Can I help? it, we'll freeze looking the completely wrong way. We need it to turn around and face the chat, which is really easy to do. So what we're going to do is come back to our trigger here and just under our play audio async, I'm going to create a new event called start camera. And unfortunately, because we're using a loop in order to smoothly rotate the camera, you're going to have to do it as an event, not a function, but it shouldn't matter. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to drag in my player controller. So this is where it gets a bit different. I'm using a first person setup now so the way I get the camera and move the camera is different to how a third person camera might move. Depending what camera system you have in your game you will need to adapt this part of the code to match your camera system and I'm just going to mark it as private because nothing else needs to access it. Then I'm going to drag in my player character and I'm going to get the first person camera and I'm going to get its world location and then drag from this and I'm going to do a find look at rotation. The find look at rotation works out all the maths you need in order to make camera face in Unity, you have the look at function. In Unreal, you have a find look rotation. And then for the target, we need to get the NPC who we need to look. So I'm going to add a new variable of NPC shot owner. And I'm going to set it to a type of VP NPC in my case. But you can set it to whatever you want. And I'm going to click the eyeball. You will see I can now pick the shot owner. So the keeper, where do you need to look? If it's a vending machine, you'll click the vending machine. In my case, I'm going to pick like so, which I've just renamed to Glenn's Hot Dog. So what we can do is drag in our shot owner here and I can get actor location and I can plug it into the target. So this should handle giving us our final rotation where the camera needs to be in order to face him. It won't move the camera, it'll just rotate. So if you want to just straight rotate the camera into position, you don't need it fading. You can just drag in your player controller and just do set control rotation and then plug it in. However, I don't want it to snap. I want it to smoothly transition across. And this is where we need a timeline. So from my set backup look at rotation, I'm going to come in and add a timeline like so. And I'm going to call it camera start. And I'm going to call it camera can. And I'm going to call it camera trans start. And I'm just going to plug it into the play from start. I'm going to double click the timeline. And I'm going to set the length to 0.5. So half a second. You, you really don't need much for a camera transition. I'm going to call this the name of it time. And I'm going to right click at the beginning and do key curve float zero. And I'm going to right click at the end and do add key to curve float zero. I'm going to highlight the first keyframe. I'm going to set the time to zero and the value to zero. Nice and easy. On the final one, I'm going to set the time to 0.5 and 1. So between 0.5 and 1, it will increase the value like so. If you want it to gain momentum, you can play with the curves to make it look however you want. I'm just going to go with a basic linear curve, which is that line. And now back in our event graph, you can see we have the time variable and we have the update and the finish. So what I want is from the update, it's going to lurk between current position of the camera 
which is our backup lookout rotation and then the new point it needs to go there and it will smoothly rotate and do all the maths for you so i'm going to drag in the backup lookout rotation and i'm going to do a lure rotator b the alpha will be our time where it is if it's zero it'll be at a if it's one it'll be a so 0 0.5 will be now that rotator can take any weight it can go clockwise anti-clockwise up down whichever way it needs to go you, you it will go the long way around so even though it makes sense to go say clockwise it might go anti-clockwise because it thinks that's what it needs so i'm just going to take shortest path so it goes quickest route to where it needs to rotate and then finally i'm going to plug the return value into the new rotator and connect it up to the fit there and now if i just wrap this in a comment called begin camera trans to mpc and then after the play audio async i'm just going to drag in my start camera there and now you'll see if i run up to him if i walk him backwards my camera should rotate around while he's speaking and show me his face oh. Oh, um, yes? Perfect! And we can come in and do that at any angle. So if I come down and look down... Uh, hi, what do you want? It will look up smoothly. You can now change, if you want it to be faster or slower, you can just change the time on the timeline to whatever you want it to be. So now that we've played the audio and we've start the camera transitioning across, the next step is to actually start rendering the UI. So I'm going to create a new function called setup UI. So inside here, I need to pass it the struct of the, the store's information. So I'm going to create a new input and I'm going to call it store info and it'll be a type of our s underscore food store like so and now we actually need to create the ui so i'm not going to create it all right now we'll do that shortly but for basics so just so we can continue with this i'm going to scroll down to my ui folder here i'm going to right click and i'm going to do user interface widget blueprint i'm going to just click user widget and i'm going to call it wb food door and i'm going to open this up i'm going to go to the graph and i'm going to add a couple of default variables we need in order to set the food store up so it's got the data it needs to run so the first thing i'm going to do is the food store owner and this is going to be the blueprint that actually runs the store so it's going to be bp food store so it'll be my trigger point and i'm going to tick the eyeball and also i'm going to make sure i tick expose on spawn you'll see why shortly next i need to pass it the actual data that it needs in order to run so i'm going to come in and add a food data and it'll be a type of s underscore food store like so eyeball and expose on spawn so we can now hit compile and save if i come back to my bp food store here i can drag off and i can do a create widget and it's going to ask for a class so the class we're going to give it is our wb food store and you will see because we tick the expose on spawn and we're spawning the ui it's asking us to provide variables for it so the store info will be the food data like so the store owner will be the self because that's what we're referencing and then the owning player will be our player controller so we can drag that in and just connect. so we're going to be using keys in order to control the ui so we need a way to actually store this so we can access it again so when we exit it we can destroy it we can pass keys along to it and do everything else we need so we need a generic way in order to store this food ui or other UIs such as clothing UIs, mechanic UIs, gun UIs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down into my blueprints in my content drawer and I'm going to go into my interfaces folder. If you don't have a folder just create. I'm going to right click blueprint blueprint interface and I'm going to call it BPI shop menu and this is basically going to say every time we apply a shop menu we're going to apply this interface and we can say you must have these functions in order to work and then when we implement those functions we can call anything that uses the interface and say run this code run this code because we know it has it because it's got the interface so the three functions we need is we need purchase i'm going to add a new function and i'm going to do exit and then the final one i'm going to do is i'm going to add a move and then that's all we need so i can compile and save that so back in my widget blueprint for my food store the ui i'm going to come down to the class settings and i'm going to scroll down until you see implemented interfaces i'm going to add my new bpi shop menu and you will see the interfaces have all popped up so we can actually start using Using them. So we now know those functions exist. The reason we've done this is back on the player here, we can create a new variable called current shop menu and we can set it to our new shop menu interface like so. We don't need it to. And I can compile and save. And what this allows us to do is when we spawn the UI, we can just take it now and set it on the player so we've got a reference to it at all times. So if I do set current shop menu, 
because it's using the interface I can connect it up and I can plug it in and then the final thing I can just do add to viewport and this will actually render it on screen like so. The final thing we now need to do is we need to disable the player's input mode. So I'm going to drag the player controller in and I'm just going to do set input UI and game. You must click and game otherwise the keyboard won't work when you're in the UI which is the odd. The widget in focus is going to be my current shot menu so I can just drag that across and now I can compile and save jump back into my event graph and now we need to pick the best place to render the UI. See for me I want it to render the UI after the here finished speaking. I don't want it to render it before because otherwise you can be clicking things and because he's still speaking other audio won't play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag the audio async and the start camera across a little bit and I'm going to drag my audio in. Also a quick tip if you want to clear up some of the room in the stroke just click hide unconnect pins on the break and it'll just hide everything so you've got more space. And then from the audio I'm going to drag down and I'm going to do an assign on audio finish there and I'm going to connect this up just like you would normally. What this is going to do is bind to the audio components event display of finish. So when it finishes playing audio, it calls this event here so we can do stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the audio and I'm actually going to unbind the event we've just added to it. I'm going to do unbind event from audio finished and I'm going to plug it in and I'm going to plug it in. So you are right, it is weird, but the reason we're doing this is when we first start it, we play bind to the event finished and play audio. As soon as the audio finishes, we unbind from it and say, well, we don't care anymore because we've already, we know it's finished, we can carry on doing what we need. And what we need to do is we need to put the setup UI in like so. Then the only other thing we need is to get the store info. So from the out row, I'm just gonna connect it all the way down to store info, which it looks a bit messy. I don't like it there. So I'm gonna just double click the line in order to add some breaks. And I'm just gonna nicely traverse it down just so you can follow it a bit nicer like so. It works. There we go. So we are almost there, ladies and gentlemen. We are slowly getting to the point where it will eventually start working. The next step we need is we need to be able to pass our controls as I referenced in the setup UI here, where we store the interface. When we press the keys we actually need to sort of send it to the current shop menu and say the player has pressed leave the player has purchased so back on your first person character or your, your character i'm going to come to the graphs and i'm going to create a new event graph i'm going to call it shop menu so you can create different event graphs and you don't need to jump between them you don't need to do anything they can still talk to each other it's just a better way of categorizing things so in this shop menu i'm going to come in and i'm going to type shop underscore and i'm going to get all of my enhanced action events not the values the events so the first one i'm going to do is purchase then i'm going to do the exact same again exit and then finally i'm going to do move like so and you'll notice they all look the same except the move has an action value a float so that's why you get the one or zero if it's up or down and of course if you're doing left or right then you'd still do the same thing left and right will be one or minus one so what we can do now is i can drag my current shop menu in and because this is an interface we can say whatever you're populated with run the purchase method and i'm going to plug that into start i'm going to do the same for exit and the same for move so on the exit i'll just do exit because exit and purchase are digital all binary options they're yes or no the move however is a little bit different so what i'm going to do is come back to my interface here the shop menu and on the move i'll just tap it or click it here i'm going to add an input of a value i'm just going to set it to a float see on a controller if you were to do the thumbstick the float can be between minus one and one it can be 0 0.8 0 0.2 minus 2 minus 0 0.8 however on a digital d-pad or a con keyboard it's minus one one zero it's that easy but we can cater for that later and on the player when we drag out our move it will ask us what value we have and we can just plug in the action value and plug it into the start of like so. So now we're almost there ladies and gentlemen. So the only other thing we need to do on the BP food store is we need a clean up event. So once the exit has been called we need to wipe the UI, give the player control back, transition the camera to where it needs to be, that good stuff. And then after that we can jump onto designing the UI and we're nearly done. So I'm going to come in and add a custom event of end, just end. And the first thing I'm going to do just like we did on the start camera is I'm going to grab current control rotation and I'm going to promote it to another variable variable called temp look at rotation. The reason we need to cache the temp look at rotation is because the lerp, when it has a starting point, if we continuously get the control rotation, it's going to keep changing and just wildly throw it off. So we need to cache it so we have a fixed point where we need to lerp from and to. But after this, we can now create another new timeline. Unfortunately, you can't reuse timelines. That'd be nice. So we're going to add the timeline and I will call it camera trans end. Then just like before, I will double click it. I will set my length to 1.5, set it whenever one float value right click key right click i key highlight one of them and set the time to 0 0.5 and the value to one and then the start one will be zero zero we can save that then back on the event graph i will connect it to the play start just in case anything happens and then from the update i can drag in the player controller and i can just do set control rotation plug the controller in and plug it in then from the new rotation i can drag
struck down alert then then from the alpha variable i'll just connect it into the alpha for the alert a it will be temp rotation and then for the alert b it'll be our backup which is our starting and again i'll take the shortest path so once it's finished rotating the player's camera back we can drag down from the on finished and the first thing we can do is we can enable the player again because we're now ready to give them full control back and then the final thing is we can just start removing all the variables we've populated that could be better with it not populated so for example the player character i can just drag in a set and you can see it'll set it to nothing and clear it up same with the player controller and then just before we do both of these all i'm going to do is drag the player character in and i'm going to set the current shot menu to nothing so we're not holding it in memory basically so now that we've done that we can call the end method it will rotate our camera back to where it needs to be it will enable the player and remove all the variables the last thing we need to do is make it play some audio such as goodbye or you know something like that so i'm going to drag all this across i'm going to drag from here and i'm going to do get data table row and then just like we did previously i'm just going to select the data table of food stores and i'm going to plug in the row name and then i'm going to drag it some more across and from the out row i'm just going to break and i'm going to from the row found do play audio async so we can play our goodbye audio and it will be exit audio the weight will be one i want it to play it unless something else and there we go ladies and gentlemen there is our ending function so i've just commented it with end clear up and grab the play access and with that ladies and gentlemen the last thing we have to do now is just to create the ui so i'm going to jump back to the widget blueprint food store and i'm going to go into the design here so the first thing i'm going to add is a canvas panel and this is just going to mean it will take up as much space as we need to like so there we go inside here i'm going to add in a vertical menu because i want the controls at the top and the actions below so on the vertical box i'm just going to come and click the anchors and i'm going to press Control shift and click our entire left side and i'm going to set the position x to 50 so it's got a little bit of room i'm going to set the offset top to 50 so it's down a bit and the size x to be 500 like so so now it's going to be a nice little widget at the left side of the screen inside here i'm going to add an overlay box like so and i'm going to call this ol controls because this is where we're, our control are going to be right at the top inside here i'm going to add a rich text box and i'm going to call this rtb controls and i'm going to make sure that this one is ticked for a variable and nothing else so far is i'm going to set it take up the maximum room and the maximum fill so i'm just going to open up my web browser and i'm going to go to prompt font and i'm just going to find some up and down arrows for now have we got any and i'm just going to come and set the text to be use then i'm going to put my input and i will say w and then or put so i'm going to put use w or s so i'm just going to set my set text style to be my dt text out and you will see it will say use w or s to select food and we can change this eventually with the platform specific controls and i'm going to press shift enter to go to the next line and then i will put my input and i will say it is my shift to buy or i'll put my input again and say it's return to quit if i press save now you can see it says press the keys in order to control it so now that we have our text i just want to round around it so i'm going to come up to my palette and i'm just going to add an image and i'm just going to put it inside the overlay i'm going to set the color an opacity to black so zero 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 and i'm just going to set it to something like 0 0.7 there you, go. you can see it's currently on top of the text so i'll just move the controls below it there we go i'm going to set the rich text box padding to about 20 just so it's got a nice little border around it and now that we've done that back on the vertical box i can add another i can just duplicate the overlay controls here and i will call this overlay food the image will re remain the same but the difference is on the overlay food now i'm actually going to add a padding top of 50 just to push it down down from the top so it's not cramped in and then where i've got the rtb controls i'll call it rtb store name and this time i'm going to get rid of all of this and i'm just going to wrap it in an imp because that's what mine's called and i'll just call it store for now like so i want mine floating on the line here because i think that'll look pretty cool so what i'm actually going to do is set the padding on here to 10 minus 20 and then 10 10 and now it sits on it it looks dodgy in the editor but when it's actually in the game it will look quite nice as you can see so the next thing we need to now do is under the overlay we need to add a scroll box see unless you add a lot of food the scroll box will never really take into effect but it's safer to have it than not to have it so i'm going to come in and call it sv underscore food i'm going to make sure it's as a variable i'm going to set it to fill both containers like so and i'm going to set the padding of it to be 10 30 10 and 20 and this will give it enough room to expand down so when we add loads of text to it so if i just add a bunch of things to it it will go down but it won't overwrite the store at the top so the ui is taking shape ladies and gentlemen and that pretty much 
the main UI done. That will keep expanding down and the scroll bar will take over when it hits the bottom of the screen. But what we need to design is the actual items that sit within here because it's kind of a mixture of a button but then when you press up and down it needs to select them and it needs to have multiple elements on it. And because we're going to be creating it dynamically it's going to be better to create it as a set component. So back in the content drawer in your UI folder where we've got WB food store I'm going to right click user interface a widget blueprint again. There'll be another user widget and I'm going to call it WBC for widget blueprint component and I'm going to call it food menu item and this is going to be one of the items that actually sits inside the scroll bar. So in here I'm just going to come in and add a horizontal bar then I'm going to add a button inside of it. Button will be our actual button that we click and I'm going to set it to be fill so it takes up the entire space it can and I'm going to set its padding to be 4, 2, 10, 4 and 10. So 4, 2, 4 and 10. So it's got a big padding at the bottom to push other buttons away but it's got a nice little padding inside of it. I'm going to come and set the tint of it to be alpha 0 so it's invisible on the normal. On the hovered I'm just going to come and set it to be something like 0.4 so it's slightly visible but not massively visible and then when you press it I'll just make it even darker so I'll set it to something like point there we go. So it'll always be transparent but it'll be slightly there. Now I'm going to add another horizontal box inside of the button like so and then inside this horizontal box I'm going to add two text elements. Control D to duplicate. This first one will be txt food name and I'm going to make sure it's as variable and then the second one will be txt cost and also make sure this is as a variable. On the food name I'm just going to give it some demo text chicken and I'm going to make sure it's set to fill so it takes up every bit of space it can and just as a test to make to actually see what it looks like I'm going to come up to the fill screen and I'm just going to select desire. This will be shrinking it as in the smallest screen that it'll probably be on and we can see it says chicken there. If I grab this text block here and just set it to something like four dollars you'll see that they're cramped together but that's fine because what I'm going to do on the cost is I'm just going to set it to be the end not to take up the full amount of space. Just make sure on your horizontal box you tick fill vertically and horizontally and then if you go back to your food store and add your food menu item into the scroll bar you'll see it takes up the maximum amount of space and it's where it needs to be. And now we have our items. Perfect. So let's give them some functionality so when we're done it actually updates and we can change it down. So on the button I'm just going to scroll down and click the on click event and this will mean we can take over and do what we need to. I'm going to delete the event tick and the pre-construct because we don't need those. So on construct what we basically need to do is set this instance of this button up with the correct text and the correct amount. So what I'm going to do is come and create a variable in here called food item and I'm just going to set this to a type of PDA food and this will be the asset that this food presents. And I'm going to make sure I tick expose on sort and then also edit. So what I can do now is drag the food name in and I can also drag the txt food name and I can do set text plug it in and then from the food item I can do get food name and I can plug it in just like so and now every time we pass in the food item it will render the food name and then we can do the exact same thing cost so set text but the only difference this time is from the cost text I'm going to drag a format out and then just like we did before I'm going to put a dollar then I'm going to put a curly brace and put cost and this just means now when we drag in the food item and we do get cost we can plug it in and it will start with that dollar perfectly fine and now the next thing we need to do is we need some way of telling the parent that a food item has been clicked because then this gives us maximum control of contacting the player stuff like that so what I'm going to do is in my menu food item I'm going to create an event dispatcher called on on button click and on the actual click event we've added I'm just going to call it just like that and the only other change I'm going to do is I'm going to click my event dispatcher and I'm going to add an input called food item and I'm going to set it to the exact same type as our food item just above so PDA food and I'm going to connect it into it so when we click button if something is using this event dispatcher it will tell us when that button is clicked and what asset the button belongs to meaning we can get all the data we need Element. I'm going to come into the graph here and I'm going to delete the event tick and the event pre-construct because we don't need them. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the food, the store's name. So I'm going to drag the RTB in store name. I'm going to drag up and I'm going to do set text and I'm going to match it up. From the text I'm going to drag out a format text because I want to be able to wrap it with my imp to make it the color so imp and then I'm going to curly brace and put name and wrap it with the curly brace again. For the name we can now drag in the food data, we can break it or split it either way. 
So now every time we load it up, that'll set the store name at the top to be whatever the name of your store is. I think mine's Glenn's Hot Dogs. And then from the food data food, we can drag off and we can do a for each loop now. And we can connect it up. From the loop body, we can drag off and do a create widget. And this is where we create our child. So WBC food menu item. And you'll see it's requesting a food item, which we can just drag straight into it. The owning player, we can just do player controller. For the owning player, we can drag in the food store owner and we can do get controller, the get player controller, because that's what the variable is hashed for. Then from the return value I'm actually going to drag off and I'm going to do promote to variable. And then I'm going to just delete what we've added. So this has set us up a variable here which we can call born food items and you'll see it's already set the type for it. So what I'm going to do is just write but right clicking is a good little short. And I'm going to drag the spawn food items in and I'm going to do add that and I'm going to drag from the return value into the select asset and I'm going to drag off and do add child. And this is how we add a compound, a widget into another widget, such as the scroll bar. And then for the content, I'm just going to drag our return value in like so. And now if we've done everything right, ladies and gentlemen, if we start it and run up to it now, it should speak, transition, and show the UI. Can I help you? There we go. So now it starts. We've got a few bugs and stuff we need to solve, but it is successfully working. My exotic mango tango smoothie is a bit long. I might need to shorten the name of that one or increase the size. I've done a typo in the store's name. When I click, nothing happens, but that's what we're going to finish now. So we are successfully getting there. If I press exit, so for the first bug we had, the store's name wasn't being properly set and that's because at the end of the imp, I forgot to close the brackets off. So that's fixed that. For the width of the menu, it being a bit small, I'm going to come back into the vertical box and I'm just going to set the size X to be something like base. So now what we need to actually do is we need to bind to the child's on button click. So we can actually action when to update the health, when to take the money, etc. So what I'm going to do is after I've added this child here, I'm just going to neaten up these lines a little bit and then I'm going to drag off from this and I'm going to do assign on button click and this will create us an event dispatcher. So this is now going to tell us whenever any button in there is clicked and what its food item is and then we can start actioning it. So I'm going to drag in the food store owner and I'm going to do get player character and then the first one we'll do is the health so I can do get damageable component so that'll give us the health and I will say update health there we go so it needs a new value of what to update it in so I can grab the food item and I can do get HP value and I can plug that into the value there and that will now update the value the health of the player but what we also need to do is update the cost so I can do the exact same thing again so I'm going to copy these two and paste it over here and I'm going to do my get cost I'm going to do my get cash and then I'm going to update and I'm going to drag from the cash and do change cash and then the final thing is to drag from the food item again and this time just do cost get the cost and i'm going to drag this cost into the value there and then i'll just neaten up all the lines there we go so with a bit of commenting that ladies and gentlemen should now successfully take the cash when you do it update all the ui and give you the health benefits so let's try it so you can see i can run up to him now oh um he'll speak to us and we can see it's now neatly given us more room so for glenn's hot dog stand let's add a grilled chicken skewers keep an eye on the price and the health bar. Boom, we've increased it actually. Ooh, we need to flip that around. Um, but yes, the health has increased and we can just keep going, 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 going. But we, theoretically, we're going to run out of money. So what we need to do is now disable the options if we can't afford it. So just to fix the negative cost, because that's the only one we want, I'm just going to drag from the cost and multiply it. And I'm just going to buy one. And that should flip it around to a negative. Next, we need to work on disabling. You can see now when I run up to uh, him. Hi, what do you want? And I can come and say 15. We've now gone down 15. 15, I can do 10 and we go to zero because we can't buy any more. Perfect. One slight change I'm going to do to mine on my blueprint act component for the cash. I'm just going to set the minimum to the to the same as the maximum but minus because then I can go into the negatives as so we set the, the HUD up to handle that. You can see when I walk I up now, you? if I buy 15 and 15 again, you can see we now go into negatives and in San Andreas' terms, the mob's going to come after us. Perfect. So now let's work on disabling the items. So back in the menu food item here, I'm going to add a function called check cash status. And what this function is going to take in is an input player's cash which is going to be the current amount of cash the player has and I'm going to set it to a type of integer and then I'm going to drag from the player's cash and say if it's less than and I'm going to drag in the food item and do cost so if it's less than cost then we need to disable the button because we don't want to be able to press it anymore so I'm going to drag the button in and do set enable and I'm going to connect it to the less than check and I've just flipped my logic around so I'm going to delete that and do is player's cash greater than or equal than the cost so if the player has more cash or exact amount of cash to buy it 
then set it is enabled to true so you can press it otherwise set it to false so now that we've done that all of the buttons will have function so all we can do now is go back to our food store and create a new function called check all cash status there we go so i can drag in my array of spawned food items and i can do a for each loop over it and then for each button i can just drag off and do call check cash status and i just need to tell it how much cash to play is so i can drag in the food store owner i can get the player character and then finally i can get his cash there we go and i can finally get his cash and plug it in so all that will come in and every time you click a button it will disable all the buttons if you don't have cash to buy it once you purchased it and now that we have that function we can come back to our event graph and after we've purchased it and removed the cash from the player i can just come in and drag in the check all cash status there so the only other thing we need to do is if the player already doesn't have enough money we need to check it while we're creating it so what i'm going to do is come across add just after we add the child to the scroll box i'm just going to drag all this event here and i'm going to drag it across a little bit to give me some space and then i'm going to come and grab the food owner cash function and i'm going to paste it in here and then i'm just going to drag from this blue line and say check cash status like so and i can plug it in and i can plug the cash in and we can make it a bit neater it's a bit remote just like so and i can continue it on to the bind event and now with this if we don't have enough money when we go up to him so i'm going to go back to the dt food stores i'm just going to add another food to this guy and we'll add a veggie delight wrap and because it's vegetarian we'll say it's like you know 25 costs so it's already too much for the player with our measly 20 dollars and i'm gonna run up and i'm gonna go into oh. it and you will see it's already disabled we can't buy it because we don't have enough money perfect and i can come up here i can buy the 15 one and the others get disabled and i can buy the five everything is disabled there we go ladies and gentlemen hp is increased our cash is decreased everything is disabled the only thing we need to fix now is we have a current error that when we try to exit or when we first join that something's not working so let's have a look so after debugging i found the issue so the move here constantly reporting the action value of zero even though we don't need to know if it's zero so i'm going to come and drag and say if the action value equals zero then if it's true because it's zero i'm not going to do anything otherwise i'm going to go to the false and do it only if we press up and down will it actually action it otherwise if it's standard it'll do nothing then the only final thing we need to do is on the food store here is we need to implement the event exit just like that so we double click it it'll implement the event i can drag in the food store owner and i can call end function and then after the end function is done it's given the player control back it's rotated the camera i can just come in and the hood can nicely just remove itself from existing there we go so now you can see i can run up he talks to me i can't afford the veggie wrap it's spelled wrong and i can say oh i want a hot dog and he's gone yeah here's your hot dog money's gone down health's gone up i want a grilled chicken skewer perfect but now i can't afford anything so i'm gonna quit and you can see he said goodbye perfect the next part of enabling your player again is to just drag in the player controller and then make sure you set game mode game only game input mode game only this will mean you will be given back control afterwards so one last bug we've got to fit is our move is controlled by w and s so if you run up to the character and it begins it it switches out the input context before the current shot menu is populated meaning it fails i'm going to drag in the current shot menu and i'm just going to drag off and say convert it to an object and then i'm going to check if the object is valid only if the object is valid then we will allow the character movement to run through otherwise we won't and because it's an interface it doesn't technically count as an object which is why we need to cast it to an object so now you can see if we hold w when we run up to him it won't matter it won't error because w. we're checking if it's valid there we go no errors then the last thing to do after we before we check all the cache status is we can drag off the food data we can blit it to get the purchase audio and then from the food store owner we can drag and type audio play async and we can connect this up i'm going to set my weight to be something like 0.8 so it doesn't always say anything i've just realized i've made the weight an integer all this time uh, it needs to be a float so make sure your weight is a float it should only be a minor thing and then back in here there we go i can come back and set it point the purchase audio i can connect up i can click this and just stick it to there to there and then it will check all the cash status so it's got 0.8 of a chance to actually say something when you purchase it so i run up and i will pick it up and then where the weight is wrong here i'm just going to come in and set it to a one there and just refresh this there we go so the play audio async is one there and i just need to do it on the end as well there we go so they're both ones and now when i run up I test it this is it ladies and gentlemen i run up i test it oh. he speaks to us i'll buy a hot dog finger lick oh yeah copyright and he speaks to us i make them all myself enjoy
Finger lick. Oh yeah, copyright. There we go, and I can quit. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. We have now successfully made the Grand Theft Auto San Andreas style shop system. So can you I help come you? In, and then we've got nothing there. Come we back can quit. soon. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. So there are, of course, loads of add-ons and directions you can take this. You can make it so that first bit skippable if you prefer. You can change the controls to be platform specific and plenty of other ways you can take it. Uh, the framework is all there. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you've got any other suggestions, please let me know. If if you would like an add-on video for this to show you how to do different aspects with it, please let me know. Thank you for watching. I've been Decryption and I will see you next time.